loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing a Q&A for you. I asked for these questions on Instagram and we have lots to get through. I wanted to do a Q&A just to catch up basically. The last time I did one of these I was very heavily pregnant so I thought I would answer a few questions outside of a vlog. Some of this stuff I may have touched on before but hopefully we'll just go into proper depth with it today. I've tried to answer the most asked questions um, and I've basically just written them down as topics basically so we'll just do it that way because lots of you asked the same questions. I did get asked a few questions that I did answer in my pregnancy Q&A so if you haven't watched that go and check that out. I will leave a link down below. Um, I will also be doing a couple of videos, well three videos. One will be a book recommendations Q&A thing so I will ask you to ask me <laughs> to recommend you something either in a specific genre for a specific thing books similar to a certain author all of that kind of thing so i'll be doing that sort of like a book q a a book recommendations q a um i've done a reading one in the past just answering questions about reading in general i will leave that down below as well um if you haven't watched that and you're interested but yeah this one will be more like focused on the actual books um, someone also suggested in my Q&A box this time doing the same thing with outfits like an outfit for work, an outfit for like a wedding and I think that's a really fun idea as well so I want to do that. I don't love my mirror set up here so I'm going to have to figure that out. I am really struggling with my setups here at home um, and I also want to do a piercings and tattoos video maybe with a Q&A element because it's been ages since we did one of those so I will do that for you as well. Okay, <laughs> end of spiel. Let's get into the question. So I had a lot of you ask, when will you be moving into the house? Do you have a move-in date? We don't have a move-in date per se. Um, we would love, <laughs> and I say this so cautiously, we would love to be in that house before Christmas 2022. <laughs> um, I think that's a generous estimate. Uh, I know that seems absolutely ages away. It is ages away. There's a lot to do at the house. And obviously um, we have the little one now, so I don't really want to move in while there's a lot going on. I suspect even when we move in, there will still be stuff to do. I don't know what we're gonna do about furnishing the place because that is gonna be expensive. So I doubt we'll have much furniture whenever we move in. But anyway, I would love to be moved in by Christmas 2022. That is giving extra time on what our contract has told us. Um, but having watched my mum do lots of works in the past and renovations and all sorts, I know that these things can be hampered with setbacks. And everything also needs to be coordinated. There's so much, so much coordination going on between different teams that sometimes everything stops for a few weeks. So that is my very cautious estimate um yeah I will be really sad if we if we aren't in by next Christmas I had a few questions like do I miss studying did I get the post uni blues and tips for beating the post uni blues and yes I did I honestly didn't expect to feel as sad as I did after I left uni. I don't know why, I just clearly hadn't come across this as a concept, but I didn't know it was a thing that you can really get the post-uni blues and, and it's very common um, and I wish someone had told me at the time, so <laughs> let me say it now to any of you who are coming up to the end of your university experience. Obviously a lot of you have been through a pandemic at university as well, which is a whole different ball game and carries all of its own implications on your mental health and solidarity to you guys because you have done an amazing job if you have been going through uni at the same time as the pandemic. I have really, really felt for students at school and uni throughout this whole thing because it's been so disruptive and so not good. It really feels like a lot of you have missed out on big things that you won't get back so I know that, that must be really really hard and you are doing an amazing job um, if you are trying to study through all of this. Yes I wish someone had told me pandemic or no pandemic that you will feel sad when you leave uni. Um, I really missed my friends, I really missed living with my friends, obviously moving back home has its own thing as well, um, I felt quite lonely 
and it was just hard. I just felt like I, I didn't know what I was doing, basically. I felt very lost. I kind of had it in a couple of waves because I obviously moved home and away from Edinburgh and away from my friends and living with my friends and that was weird and um, sad. <laughs> and then I had a second wave when I finished my masters. Um, so yes, it's totally normal and it will pass when you sort of find your life again <laughs> and find your rhythm again and a bit of purpose again and I found that I really just had to ride it out um, you know try and reconnect with friends at home if you're going to work try and like kind of find a group of friends there I think it's very much the social aspect that you might miss but I promise you um, they will go away and yes I do really miss studying the other half of the question I loved exercising my brain I do really miss that I think I will get it back again in the future whether it's through independent study or study um, you know at a university but yes I miss it for now I do miss using my brain in that way um, I had a few questions on how do you find the time to read now you're a mum and I have touched on this in vlogs I think and I think I also predicted this in my pregnancy Q&A but an e-reader guys it is the best thing if you are a mum um, a kindle or something is the way for there are roadworks happening directly outside our house and I'm trying to film this video <laughs> and they keep drilling it's like 5pm on a Friday so I'm thinking could they stop um, anyway an e-reader is the way to go when I was doing very long night feeds I was reading a lot on my kindle it's backlit you can use it one handed um, they're nice and light you know you're not going to get tired arms yes I am doing fewer night feeds now they're a little bit quicker and also I think she's just got so big something about holding the kindle isn't working so much for me but you can just like carry it kind of around the house with you I'm trying not to be on my phone too much around her so in those moments when she's playing by herself I'm trying to read a little bit more so she can see me reading instead which is obviously good you want to model the behavior that you want so for that reason I'm probably able to move back to light, easily transportable books, small ones, um, for the daytime. So yes, but at the moment I am finding it a bit trickier than I was because like I said, I'm not doing as many of those feeds and something about her and feeding and my arms and holding the Kindle. And also she's a bit more aware if there's light, even the backlight of a Kindle. So I'm finding it a bit trickier to to read during night feed but yes I have been trying to read in front of her while she's playing independently sometimes that lasts for like a few minutes but hopefully we can get into a good habit with that um, also in the near future I want to implement days where I try to do a bit less during her nap times because I was finding myself trying to do too much and I think I need to find a bit more of a balance so um, I would like to read a little bit more during her nap times just as a kind of restful activity that I can do that still feels like time for myself and nice of course we've all got stuff to do around the house um, lots of us having to work it's tricky when the baby goes down for a nap to decide to do something that isn't productive but um, a couple days a week or a couple naps a week I want to try and do that because otherwise I think I'll go a bit stir crazy um would I live in Edinburgh again I don't think I would live in Edinburgh again I loved it I love keeping it as a bubble for my kind of student days I love visiting I love going to the fringe but it is quite a small city and I do like being back in London now that I've re-familiarised myself with it and everything that's going on here. So will I ever show baby's face online? And I have talked about this a little bit in vlogs and I promise this will be the last I speak about this because I'm sure some of you are bored and you totally get what I'm doing. But I thought I would just make a final statement. So my final thoughts on it are, because um, I had a little think about it and I was like, what is it that I want for her and what is it that I don't want for her in terms of what I do for a living? You know, I get why with celebrities who are having paparazzi pictures taken of them and that sort of thing. I can totally understand why they put a blanket ban on 
people seeing their children's faces. Obviously also they have a lot more exposure and a lot more people know who they are. So it's a big security risk. Um, you know, if the kids are with a nanny or this, that and the other, or what school they're at, you know, they'll be instantly recognized as celebrities' children at whatever school they're at, etc., etc. And I thought for me, who is a YouTuber, pretty small fry in the grand scheme of things, um, what I'm protecting her from is different. It's like prolonged exposure. It's a sort of, um, what I do is very personal. You see a lot of me, you see a lot of our living space. You know, I tell you things about my life. It's a kind of different thing. And what I am protecting her from is that sort of prolonged exposure. And I want her to be able to have her privacy. And me being online, that's not gonna be perfect. Do you know what I mean? She is gonna have less privacy than other kids just through the nature of what I do, because I'm her mum. It will be impractical to me to never show her face because, not impossible, and I know people do it, and I totally get why they do it, but sometimes in aid of the story of the vlog, or say she's accidentally in the background and I don't notice, or this, that, and the other, you will see her face here and there. You will see her here and there. That's also partially to protect my brain about it because uh, if I never show her face and then something happens, someone else posts it, etc, etc, I think it will create a lot of anxiety in me. Um, and I also find if you never do it, then people become a little bit more obsessive about it. And I know that is not the majority of you. It is the like 1% of you <laughs> that are watching this. Um, but it keeps it controlled. So I don't know if you, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm hoping that I will be able to maintain that level of privacy for her as far as possible and just not have her all the time in front of the camera. But if she pops up here and there, I don't want it to um, cause a lot of anxiety for me. And I also, like I said, don't think that's what I'm protecting her from, if you know what I mean. But I don't think occasional glimpses of her face, her being, is what I'm, you know, most concerned about. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but for example, it's kind of the way you might see Zach in my vlogs, you know, he is often there, you sometimes glimpse him, sometimes see a little bit more of him, sometimes see less of him, but I've always been private about my relationship with him. It's a similar sort of deal with the baby, I think. And kind of an exa another example might be you know once her bedroom is fully finished and she's moved into it at the new house i will never film in there because i want that to be her space you know i'm already inviting thousands of people <laughs> into her living room her kitchen her living space so i want her to be able to have her bedroom as like a place of safety from the camera if you know what i mean she can do what she wants in there she can make her own design choices. Might show you a little bit as we're, as we're doing it, um, but once she's in there, or if she has any input into it, you know, I won't be filming in there. It's that, it's that sort of thing that I'm talking about. As parents, we make so many choices for our babies, and um, a lot of them we make before we really know them, or we know how they'll turn out, or what they'll want in the future, and we have to, it's kind of a necessity, you know, you can't ask a baby um, what what they want. You know, maybe she'll be upset I didn't film more of her. Um, I do try to remember on vlogging days to have like an Inez cut, so that she will have her own memories within those vlogs, um, but you know, it's extra work for me and sometimes I just need to get videos up. You know, maybe she'll come to me one day and she'll be like, why didn't you film me more? I wish I had all these memories um, and I'm sort of cut out of them. And maybe she'll be pissed off about that. You know, everyone is different. Everyone has a different vibe. Um, this is the choice I'm making for now. But yes, yeah, so don't be alarmed if you do see her face here and there. I know some of you were concerned with one of my recent vlogs. You're gonna see her occasionally. It's gonna be in a controlled fashion and it's not gonna be prolonged exposure. Like I said, all parents will make this decision for their own babies and that is fine and I do not judge anyone for doing anything differently from me because everyone is making their own choices based on the information they have, the type of person they are. I had a few questions about what interior style we're gonna go for in the new house. So, 
I think we want to keep it fairly traditional. Zach and I like the look of old stuff and we're trying to restore a lot of the house. There will be new elements to it, obviously, and elements that <laughs> wouldn't have really been um, fitting at the time when it was built. But we want to keep it fairly traditional, but in a sort of um, undone, rusticy type way. I seriously keep having to pause the camera because they keep starting to drill. So I'm sorry if I if this is really disjointed, but yes, in a sort of, so it's not gonna feel very like done, um, old fashioned in a way that it would, it's not gonna look like a museum. <laughs> I want it to look like a home. I want it to have a gentle cluttered feel, not super cluttered, but just feel cozy, homely. Um, yeah, so it's gonna have some old elements, gonna have some rustic elements. It's gonna have a hint of industrial but not too much so that's what we're thinking it is going to be very different from my mum's house and the sort of interiors that you've seen um, here um, I love what my mum's done I like most established interior styles but yes that's kind of what we want for our house and each house also will require a different approach I think and because that house has a lot of its original features you know it's not really been touched since the 70s when they put all those horrible carpets down and did various other horrible things but it hasn't really been touched since then so it's got a lot of its Victorian elements um, and it's really crying out to be restored I think to that vibe so yes um, and if we had a Georgian house we'd do something different if we had a modern house we'd do something different I had a few questions on how I get out of a slump because I have been in one for a couple of weeks and it's been rubbish I hate feeling like that I did have a few hours extra sleep this morning Zach took the baby and I actually slept sometimes I most of the time I try and do stuff or over the past few weeks I've tried to do stuff in that time when actually I should have just been sleeping because I had a few hours extra sleep and I feel like a different person. Um, but yes, anyway, that is beside the point. First thing I do is, at least for a few days, I let myself feel it. Obviously, by the way, if it is caused by um, mental health problems, please seek help other than this because this is not going to be helpful because this isn't about that. It's about when you kind of just get yourself into a bit of slump and you want to get yourself out of it. But, um, you know, mental health issues can really prolong um, these feelings. If it's just a kind of normal slump, um, then I let myself feel it for a few days. You know, I just let myself wallow <laughs> for a few days and just feel a bit crap and just, I'll say it out loud, I'll say it to Zach, I'll say I'm feeling crap and he'll be like, that's okay. <laughs> and um, that's really important, I think, is to, to not dismiss it. And then I try and, and hopefully, during that time I'm getting a bit of extra rest I think that's really important um, is actually your body's just saying get some more rest so I've got a bit of extra rest and hopefully I can sort of feel the balance tipping and it is very much like walking on a tightrope I think with this sort of thing like you've got to feel the shift and sometimes it's very gentle in your energy levels and when I get to that stage and I said in a recent vlog some days um, when you're feeling a bit shit doing something will make you feel better and sometimes doing something will make you feel worse and it's very fine line <laughs> but um when you feel that energy shift that's when i write a list of really manageable tasks and try and get a few things done just a few small things done and i'll slowly build back up you know i know that sometimes these things are not an option like you have to do stuff if you have to do stuff through a slump just and obviously I'm looking after a baby so I had to do some things I just tried to minimize it down to like what I could what I could just about get away with basically every day um, so I'd recommend you try and do that try and break things down into really 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 manageable chunks that you can take off and once you start taking things off you're gonna feel so much better that's how I do anyway and then slowly I come out the other side but that's a very quick run through of how I sort of get out of a slump, but if you're in one, it's okay. It's been a very, very, very long 18 months. Um, it's tough. Any Everything can feel like a lot at the minute. So just if you need to sit and feel it for a bit and you need to rest a bit, then do that. Someone asked me, and she's a teacher I think, how to encourage students who feel discouraged by reading. Um, 
I don't know the full answer to this because some kids just won't like reading. It is a hobby, it is a thing people do for pleasure and if they don't like it, they don't like it. But I do think we can encourage people to read more by just encouraging them to read like whatever they want because all reading is good reading unless it's like harmful somehow. <laughs> reading graphic novels, reading magazines, newspapers, non-fiction, anything um, can help sort of be a gateway into reading more regularly. So that's what I would recommend is just helping them to find something that they enjoy reading. Even if it's not something that you would typically think of as reading. Which novel would you like to see made into a movie? This is a good one. And it would be the Broken Earth trilogy, but I want it animated. <laughs> I don't want it live action, okay? I want it animated. A few of you asked, how do you maintain your sense of self after birth, after having a baby? My answer to that is, I don't really yet. And I think because she's so small and she needs me so much and she needs her parents so much it's going to be really hard to do and think outside the parent box I think for quite some time and I really think I will get that back as she gets older you know when she goes to school I have so much free time I don't know what I'm going to do with myself then I can concentrate again on personal projects and that sort of thing but I'm not too worried about losing myself I suppose now because I know it is sort of temporary if you know what I mean and that's not how I felt when she was first born when she was first born I was like oh my god how am I ever gonna be myself again because when they're first born obviously they really really do need you they want contact all the time they want feeding all the time it's very intense and sometimes I think it can feel a bit like oh my god what have I done <laughs> but I've already seen how much she's changed She's already gaining a little bit of independence. You know, she's still a baby, so she still needs me a lot. Um, I'm still not able to do lots of things that I would usually do for me, but it's just made me see how changeable things are. It showed me that I need not worry so much about things because it's all a phase and it will all change. If I am blessed to have another baby in the future and I would like to have another one, um, I will stop worrying so much in those first few months about trying to do this, that and the other because um, they grow up so quick. Um, however, <laughs> having said that, I do think I probably do do a lot of things that people would consider, um, you know, time to myself. Well, it is time to myself. Um, and I think those are really important. So I've had my massages, as you've seen in vlogs, I go get my nails done, I do my work. I have a couple of days a week where I spend most of my time working and away from her. So apart from feeding, obviously, but um, so I do really have that time and that's all from having a supportive partner, a good support system. Yes, definitely communicating with your partner that you need that time if you're not getting it is important. But yes, for the bigger things, the bigger projects that I wanna do in my life, of course, you know, I feel like, you know, I could easily feel like I've lost that part of me, but it's just for now. Also, a few of you asked about how I feel about my body after pregnancy, and again, I've had a very similar sort of trajectory of thought with that, because at the beginning, um, it's very hard. You go through very drastic changes very, very quickly. Um, with pregnancy and then after birth and it can feel it can really mess with your head and it can feel very strange you feel like you're not yourself you feel like this is not your body but again something I've come to realize is the only constant really is change and you know I can and will be fit again I will be strong again I will have more time in the future to dedicate to that sort of thing and if I go through another pregnancy again I'll have to do all of this again <laughs> my body will fluctuate and change and I just sort of have to sit and embrace it and I think what's really helped is seeing other people document their body changes for example Brittany Balin has done a lot about her post pregnancy body and it's amazing how much it changed over time without her even doing a whole lot so I know that I will change even if I do nothing I know that I will change now I've started exercising more regularly and I know that 
because I'm breastfeeding at the moment and this is scientific I think but I can also just tell from looking at myself that my body is clinging on to fat at the minute it wants me to be it wants the makeup of my body to be more um, fat based so that you know should I not be able to eat tomorrow I'll still be able to feed my baby and I know when I stop breastfeeding that will probably change and I know a lot of people do go through very permanent changes um, from pre-baby to post-baby and I mentioned in a vlog recently I think my shoulders have got wider you know my arms have regularly felt like they're sort of coming out of their socket, sockets a little bit because of all the relaxing relaxing all my ligaments um, so I'm not really surprised and those things can be hard to handle because you're like oh, I don't want the parts of me to permanently change I have definitely got a new appreciation for just how bodies change anyway and even if I've never got pregnant never um, had a baby my body would change anyway just from getting older um, and so I'm trying to just embrace everything <laughs> um, and the thing that does bother me actually about my post baby body is my clothes um, a lot of my clothes still don't fit me and or they fit me weirdly and that's sad because um, I love my clothes I have built a collection of clothes that I really really love so we're gonna see how that pans out I know that most people including myself cannot go out and buy a whole new wardrobe post baby so we've got to make things work but it's annoying when things are ill-fitting or they don't fit things that you love so that's the thing that bothers me the most I think about my post pregnancy body again I suspect things would continue to change tips for the newborn phase I will write a post about this but not in necessarily an advice format or a tips format. I'm just gonna talk about things that I found helpful. Um, as if I was talking to me, but my main advice is don't take any bloody advice. <laughs> um, because I had a bit of a rant about this on Instagram, but there's so much advice given to pregnant women. And also, if I had heard any of the advice that I would give myself, when I was pregnant, so stuff that I personally found helpful, I wouldn't have been able to put it in context because the change is so unfathomable <laughs> going from just you to you and a baby. You can read as much as you want about it, but until you're in it, it can feel, it almost feels like irrelevant. And then maybe you'll remember some of it once the baby is born and you'll be like, oh, that makes sense now or obviously it's a bit more helpful when you're in the moment. It's so difficult to describe what it's like to have a baby and what it does to your brain that a lot of the advice, I think a lot of advice just would have gone straight over my head. So anyway, I will write a post about things that I found helpful. Um, but I would say if you're pregnant, try and enjoy as much of it as you can. I know some people have really rough pregnancies, some people have really good pregnancies. I was somewhere in the middle. Um, try and enjoy it, try and enjoy if it's your first baby, your time as a couple. But my main advice is when the baby's born, take loads and loads of pictures because they change so quickly and you'll really enjoy seeing them change day to day through the pictures. Um, make sure someone takes pictures of you and the baby <laughs> and just shower them with love and try and sort of understand where they're coming from because you know they're new to the world it's really really hard try not to worry about getting them into a strict routine the fourth trimester is very very real and I promise things will change and get easier no matter what you do so just love them give them cuddles and um, everything will be fine and it will get easier. Um, but yeah, I will write a little post on things that I found useful on my blog. Lots of questions. Sorry, we've got into the mum questions now. So I'm sorry if this does not interest you, but um, lots of questions about how I'm finding being a mum, what are the most challenging things, what are the best things, though I love it. Um, I think it's been great. Um, she is a pretty easygoing baby. And I know that these first few months can be much more challenging if you have a baby that has severe reflux and you don't really know what you're gonna get until they come out. So yes, and I can I can imagine that it can feel much, much harder and not very enjoyable at all if you've got a more difficult baby. But I am loving it more than I thought I would actually. I know, I know that sounds silly to say <laughs> because obviously I had the baby so 
I was probably expecting to enjoy being a parent, but I, yeah, I'm enjoying it even more than I thought I would enjoy it. Um, I just love watching her develop. I think it's really fascinating. And yes, of course, all the cuddles are amazing and the love and the smile. The most challenging thing I think is to find a balance with everything else, not necessarily looking after her herself. And I, like I said, if you've got a higher needs baby, um, then the challenge might be more in the baby part of it, but to me it's definitely in the balancing part of it. Balancing work, finding a new normal in your relationship, all of that sort of thing is a challenge and I didn't really expect that. I um, expected the baby part of it to be harder um, and the rest not to be as hard. Or I suppose you think of it in a sort of abstract way, you're like, Oh, I'll stop breastfeeding at six months and if you've got you know a set maternity leave you'll be like I'll go back to work at this time and I think once you've actually had the baby you can feel very very differently about things um, I know that I've definitely felt very differently now that she's here I definitely have struggled with that um, and it's very very easy to feel overwhelmed by the sheer amount of stuff going on um, you know, people say rest when the baby rests, but if you've got stuff to do, that can be so hard. Also, lots of you asked what the sort of most surprising things about motherhood have been, so I had a little think about it. Um, one of them is how much more concerned about my own safety I am now. Um, I'm a lot more worried about doing things because something might happen to me now, because obviously you want to be there for your baby and you want them to have a mum. <laughs> so um, I didn't really even think of that when I was pregnant but yeah I am now a lot more concerned about my own safety. I'm also surprised and I think all babies will be different with this so this is not going to be universal and, I, and everything I say about motherhood and babies um, that comes with that caveat by the way guys but I'm surprised by how little guidance you have to give them with a lot of stuff like they just sort of develop as long as you give them opportunities to develop um they just do it it's amazing um it just seems innate with um babies and I, I don't know what i was expecting really but um i've realized how important it is to just shower them with love give them a really safe space and make them feel content, happy, secure, safe. And if you give them all of that, then that's grounds for all their development. Yeah, I don't know what I was expecting really, but it's amazing what they just learn to do. <laughs> just from like, you know, their own watching you, I suppose, and their own determination. And that really the most important thing you can do is feed them, help them to sleep, um, and give them loads of love. Like for example, that goes for like sleep skills as well. Um, I did basically nothing. I guess using the snoo probably helped. So again, that's like opportunities and encouragement. But um, I did basically nothing to help her learn to go to sleep on her own and she just started doing it. <laughs> I think it's just really something that just happened in her own little brain. It's nothing to do with me. Um, so when I see all this advice out there about how to get your baby to sleep on their own, if that advice works, it's probably because your baby is developmentally ready to do that anyway. And if you're finding that advice is not working, then maybe they're just not ready yet. And I think the scope of when they learn, for example, to fall asleep by themselves or self-soothe is huge. It can be from really, really early on, they can come out the womb doing it basically, or from, you know, anecdotal <laughs> stuff I've been reading. It can be up to like two, three years old, but they all learn to do it. And it's not a bad thing whenever they learn to do it. It's just a developmental thing. Does that make sense? And that will obviously change as she gets older. You know, parents have to do a little bit more guidance, a bit more teaching as they go into the toddler stage. Um, but yeah, I'm just surprised by how creating a safe, secure and loving environment is the most important thing. That's the first thing and then everything else comes from there. Also, I'm covered in bruises all the time, knocking into stuff in the dark, wrestling with car seats and prams. 
I'm covered in bruises all the time. Did you consider raising Inez with no particular gender? I just find it a fascinating topic. It is something that I thought about whilst I was pregnant, sort of what my approach to this is. I'm sorry if at any point, by the way, answering this question, if I don't use the right terminology or if I say something not quite right, I do not mean to. Um, so yes, please feel free to gently correct me down below if I do. After some reflection, I think gender is something humans use to express themselves. It's a very human thing. Um, it's not inherently a bad thing and it can be like a form of art, it can be like a form of self-expression um, and people feel very strongly about it, you know, you feel very strongly whether you identify as a woman, whether you identify as a man, whether you identify as non-binary or somewhere else on that spectrum and often someone's gender expression does sort of match their biological sex and trust me I do not subscribe to traditional views on that because often it completely doesn't um, match I suppose and I think our gender expression will be informed by so many things um, biological, physiological, sociological um, and it's a really unique combination of those things that will make you you um, and will inform your gender expression and when I say biological I don't just mean your biological sex but the differing levels of hormones that we all have you know we all have slightly different levels and those will make a difference in combination with other things I think also think your mind has a lot more control um, consciously or subconsciously over your physiological self than we sort of typically think it does. So it's all a bit of, bit of a feedback loop, if you know what I mean. But yes, we decided to use female pronouns for her to begin with. I personally have always enjoyed being a woman, even with the challenges that come with it, um, and experimenting in my own way within that. Very consciously, you know, I want to make sure that she has all the opportunities possible and available to her and that I don't um, see her in a certain way because she's a girl. Um, I never limit her because of that. Um, I can't speak to my subconscious reactions, obviously. There are gonna be things that I don't catch. I'm fallible, but I want to keep those things as minimal as possible and make sure she has the opportunity to do whatever she wants to do. Um, anything I can provide for her, I want to do that. But if she ever comes to me, and she wants to change her pronouns, she wants to change her name, she wants to transition, any of that, I want her to do that. I want her to be as happy as possible. I will change how I refer to her accordingly. But why I make the point of wanting her to have all the opportunities possible is on the one hand, if she wants to continue identifying as a girl, that she never feels held back because of that, of course. But also on the other hand, if she doesn't, then she never feels like she missed out in the interim. But yeah, like with everything, again, it's a decision that all parents must make for their babies before they really know them. Parents make that decision consciously or not consciously, and what your parents choose for you will undoubtedly influence who you become. It's part of that big cocktail, it's part of that big feedback loop, but it won't be the be all and end all. Like anything in parenting, I think <laughs> we do not have total control, and that's a good thing. You want your babies to flourish and find their own way in the world. Um, but I think if you as a parent are willing to just keep the lines of communication open, be open to change and flow as your child grows up and discovers who they are, ready to listen to your baby, accompany them on their journey through life, um, that should mitigate any damage that you might do by picking the wrong pronouns for them at birth. So that was my thoughts about that, you know, it's something that I think more and more parents will be thinking about as they have babies. Uh, lots of questions on, do you think you'll ever work in publishing? Do you think you'll ever write a book? Um, I've said before that I would love to try my hand at writing. I don't have a lot of time right now. It's one of those things which I hope that I will be able to do in the future maybe um and i would maybe like to work in publishing i mean i mean it would be great to you know have my own um imprint i think that would be amazing you have to be at the right time you know i'm still young i still got a lot of life to live and um i'm very open to it in the future but and it's not just you saying this to me it's also like my dad <laughs> but some of you are asking me would I you know write for a magazine um, like reviews or something like that first of all I don't consider myself that that good of it <laughs> um, but I do sort of work in that industry just by being a booktuber and writing my reviews about everything I read and talking to you about them 
I do it, I just do it on my own platform, which is great because in lots of ways, obviously I don't have to censor myself or change what I'm gonna say to fit in with um, whatever publication I'm writing for. So I do sort of do it, just not in a traditional way, if you know what I mean. Um, anyway, my loves, I've just rambled on for a very, very long time. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it answered some of your questions. Um, like I said, I try to pick the sort of most common ones. We'll do another one of these in the future. And yes, more vlogs are coming, definitely. But yes, thank you so much for watching today. And I'll see you all again very soon. Bye.